Well, let's take our Bibles this morning and turn to John's Gospel, chapter 13. Now, if you are visiting with us this morning, one of the commitments that we as a church have is the commitment to the authority of Scripture, meaning that we believe Scripture is from God. Uh, Scripture is... um, Therefore, to be honored, obeyed, revered. And this moves us to our method of ministry, which is the preaching of his word. And we call this expository preaching, which is really the only kind of biblical preaching there is. And that's where we look at the text, study the text, and mine out of the text the truth for us today. And... If you're visiting with us, this is what we do every week. We study the scriptures. We study the Bible. And as we're in John 13, we're going to take each section as the Lord gives it to us and and mind the wonders of what God's word has for us today. Now, one of the wonderful illustrations of a sermon or an expository sermon is the analogy of a, a man who, for a living harvest pearls. You know what a pearl is, right? A pearl, you know, you might have, you might be wearing them in earrings or on a necklace. And where do pearls come from? They come from oysters. And where do they live? Well, they live in the bottom of the sea. And to retrieve a beautiful pearl, there's somebody that's got to get in a boat Put on a scuba gear, unless you can hold your breath that long. I'm not really sure. And they have to go out to the ocean where these oysters live and dive down, search and find the oyster, grab it, harvest it in his bag, go back to the boat, dump those oysters in that boat, paddle back to the shore, take all the oysters back into his office or wherever he might work, begin to open up each one of these oysters, and all of a sudden, it's, a beautiful, it's ready for putting on earrings and, and necklaces. No, it's not, right? It's not ready for that yet. And then there has to be cleaning and preparing and shining and preparing those wonderful pearls to be delivered to the customer. Well, that's the work of an expository sermon. Someone has to dive down deep in the text and find it and bring it and study it and learn and grow and bring it to the hearer so they can see the wonders of God's Word. So that's what we do as a church. That's what our commitment is. Because God's Word is authoritative. God's Word is truth. And we only grow when we hear the Word. We only grow when we understand the Bible. How many times have you read a text and are like, what does that mean? That's why you are gifted as a people of God with pastors and teachers so that you can understand the Bible, so that you can grow spiritually. And that's what we do every Sunday. Every Sunday morning, every context which we meet as a church, the Word of God is elevated so that we can grow spiritually, so we can hear from the Lord of the church, so we can hear from the Lord of our lives, Jesus Christ, and therefore live our lives for His glory. So with that being said, I want to encourage you to open your Bibles this morning to John 13, verses 5 through 11. But this morning, I'm going to read starting in verse 1 so we have the full context of this text. John 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he would depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end, During supper, the devil, having already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come forth from God and saw and was going back to God, got up from supper, laid aside his garments, taking a towel, he girded himself. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. So he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, 
do you, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered and said to him, What I do, you do not realize, but you will understand hereafter. Peter said to Jesus, Never shall you wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, then wash not only my feet, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He who has bathed needs only to wash his feet, but, it is, com but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. The humiliation of Christ is a doctrine we most often associate with Jesus only in his death and suffering at the cross. We usually think of, we, we, you should understand that there is that doctrine, the doctrine of the humiliation of Christ. And many times we only think of that as it relates to Jesus' sufferings at Calvary. But when we really think about the, the humiliation of Jesus, it is an integral part of who Jesus is from the beginning of his earthly ministry to the end of his earthly ministry. Every aspect of Jesus' earthly ministry on this earth has to do with his humiliation. Now, the definition in the Webster's Dictionary of humiliation says this. It's to reduce someone to a lower position, right? We understand that basic definition, and when we apply this definition to Jesus, we're like, wait a minute, that doesn't fit into what I understand humiliation to be, right? We use the term often to show how we've been moved from our normal position in life to another position, maybe at work, maybe you were a prestigious boss at one point and got demoted. You would say you were humiliated and moved out of your position to a lower position. But a more natural way that we use this term, humiliation, might be seen in an embarrassing situation. Maybe your kids, you take them in public, and they act in a certain manner, and you say what? I'm humiliated because of how they act, because of what they do. Or maybe someone doesn't have the maturity to realize how they're acting is shameful. Therefore, you are humiliated to be with them. Maybe you found yourself in a situation where you were the one who acted in a shameful way. And you say, well, I will never show my face back at that church. I will never go back to that place. I will never go back to work. I will never go back to this particular area because I have been humiliated. We understand that. That's how we use the term humiliation. But when we think about Jesus and his humiliation, we cannot compare our humiliation ever to Jesus Christ. The biblical definition then for Jesus Christ's humiliation, according to Westminster's Shorter Catechism, says this, and I want you to listen. Christ's humiliation consisted in his being born, and that in a low condition under the law, undergoing the miseries of this life, undergoing the wrath of God, and the cursed death of the cross in being buried and continuing under the power of death for a time. So Westminster Shorter Catechism basically is telling you that from the beginning all the way to the end of Jesus' life is a series of humiliating events that happened to Christ. But we do not need to think about the humiliation of Jesus as it being humiliating for him like we experience humiliation. So when we consider this doctrine... We must view it in light of Christ's high position. That's how we need to understand this. 
And that's why I say our humiliation does not compare to what Christ endured in his humility in coming a man living on this earth. Because we are nothing like God, right? Now, maybe one way to sort of bridge the gap in our understanding with this might be to say when we travel, let's say, to another country out of this context in America, maybe going to Europe or some other foreign land, we experience what? We experience a new culture, we experience new language, we experience new food, social dynamics. But what happens is that we adjust to those dynamics because at base, every one of us are human, right? And we can adjust if we go to Europe because when we go to London and sit down in a restaurant and realize that the British are crazy because they don't use ice anywhere. But Americans want ice, right? We want, like, we want ice every day. And I remember once being in a restaurant in England and said, hey, could I get some ice? They bring like two cubes. And they're like, sir, this is all we have. <laughs> uh, but we adapt to that kind of different culture, right? But if we marry that to Jesus' humiliation in coming to this earth, he is being interjected into an environment that is completely alien to his true nature. Thus, Jesus' humiliation was the, the, the scope of his earthly ministry, his earthly life was a series of humiliating events. So when we consider Jesus' humiliation, we must view it in light that Jesus left his high position in heaven to come to this earth. And here's how I want you to think about this. Jesus left his pre-incarnate glories. He left his rightful position at the right hand of the Father. Jesus left the worship of angels. Jesus laid aside his divine prerogatives to take on flesh and dwell among sinful humanity and to live in subjection to a corrupt and cursed world. That's what we must remember when we think of Jesus' humiliation. The Apostle Paul put it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9. Write this down so you can look at it later. He says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though He was rich, that's His pre-existence, who He truly is, He was rich, Paul goes on to say, for your sakes He became poor. That is the humiliation of Christ. So Jesus left his highly exalted place in heaven and humbled himself, as Paul points out clearly in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And there we see his high position, being in the form of God, took on flesh, humbled himself to the point of death on a cross. So this, that, this doctrine this morning, as we think of it, is essential to our faith. Because listen, think about this with me this morning. Without Jesus' willingness to humble himself and become a man, there would be no atonement. There would be no propitiation. Nor would we have a faithful high priest who can sympathize with your weaknesses and your sinful condition. This is what is significant about Jesus' humiliation. You see, the humiliation of Christ is so powerful because of Jesus' high position, right? Now think of it, th here's, what I, here's how I want you to think about it this morning. No one is shocked. No one here is shocked when you hear about the death of a homeless person. Does that shock you when that comes across the headlines in the news? Now, yeah, we're sad that someone's died for sure. But you're not taken aback. The world is not taken aback because some homeless person, some no-named, dirty, jobless person who the world looks at as a scourge sleeping on the sidewalk 
they don't give a, two cents of a thought about that individual. But lo and behold, if the Queen of England were to die, everybody and their uncle, including every network, including every citizen in Great Britain and abroad, sheds a tear and does everything to remember this great lady. When the U.S. president, for example, on Thanksgiving and Christmas, shows up at some shelter and begins to serve food, the media is there snapping pictures and swooning over how great a humanitarian the U.S. president really is because of his willingness to come and to serve the lesser among us. Dear church, do we truly grasp the depths of Jesus' humiliation? We will not grasp the depths of Jesus' humiliation because we do not fully grasp who Jesus is. You see, these earthly examples do not compare to the extent of the Lord of heaven and his willingness to humble himself and to serve sinners. Dear church, this is a rebuke against our lackluster attitude in serving others. If Jesus, the Lord of the earth, the Lord of the universe is willing to serve. Those who say follow him ought to follow his example. This is what John 13 is about. This is where John 13 pulls us in and shows us the glory of Jesus. Shows us the sinfulness of of man and Jesus' willingness to put aside all of his divine rights, all of his divine prerogatives, all of his earthly, heavenly rights, lays those aside and dons the apron of the lowest servant in this context and washes feet. This is why John 13 is so significant for us as a church. This is why this text needs to be explained and understood in light of Jesus' humiliation. So last week, we began building the porch, right, for this house. Last week, I told you, verses 1 through 4 helped set the context for the rest of what we're going to study over the next few weeks. This is the porch around the house of John 13, verses 1 to 4. It shows us the setting. It shows us Jesus' attitude. It shows us the events that make this scene so significant. And this morning, in verses 5 through 11, we're going to see three shocking acts that are going to help us march through this text this morning. And these three shocking acts in our text, are by our Lord and by Peter. And this will help us see the wonders of Jesus' humiliation. So let's begin this morning by looking at the first shocking act here in verse 5 through 7. Now, in verse 5, it says this, Then he poured water into the basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel with which he was girded. Here we see the shocking service. Now you're going to see why this is a shocking service as we pilfer through the rest of this text. But John here moves into this house of John 13 with the word then. Then sort of marks for us the next event. We see in verse 4 that Jesus' actions in verse 4 was that he got up during the this last supper, this final Passover that he planned to have with the disciples. And during this supper, what happens? Jesus gets up. He gets up from his place and 
begins, he, put, he gets up from his place, he takes off his outer garments, and he places on his garments what? The garments of a servant. And then we see in verse 5, then he pours water into a basin. Now, this is not too terribly significant, but this is the actions we see of Jesus. All the little details here in verse 5 dictate that Jesus is taking a position that would be um, unnatural for a Jew to take. This position of a servant would have been designated for someone even lower in the Jew's mindset that might even be a slave, a Gentile slave, something in, along those lines. So this is a very shocking act for Jesus. But Jesus, unhindered by popular opinion, gets up and takes on the mantle of service. And we see the, d the details here. He pours water into a basin, and these would be the necessary elements that you would need if you were going to wash your car, <laughs> wash a window, wash anything. You're going to need water. You're going to need a bowl, and you're going to need a rag. That's what he has. He has those three necessary components to do this, this particular task. And this is happening, now remember, this is happening in the middle of this meal. Because in verse 2, it says, during supper. And the following context goes through. And then in verse 5, it says, then, meaning that during the course of this meal, Jesus takes upon this action. Now, two verbs here I want you to notice is the verb wash and wipe. These are supporting the verb began. The verb here began is the point. He began to do something. He began to take action that was uncharacteristic of anything that Jesus ought to do or any of those disciples would do. And he began to do something. He started an act of Washing and wiping the disciples' feet. Listen, in verse 5, 4 and 5 really together, John is wanting to draw the reader, wanting to draw you and I into the picture. They're dining. Jesus arises from his place, takes off his outer garments, places on the clothes of a servant, and begins to wash and wipe what? Notice the text. The disciples' feet. So just think about it. In this context, they didn't have kitchen tables like we do and chairs like we do. This meal would have been enjoyed by reclining on the floor against a small table. And their feet would have extended from the table out into the middle of the room kind of a thing or out from the table. And you can picture Jesus making his way around the table Washing the disciples' feet. Kneeling down. Now just think of this. Jesus taking one foot, a dirty foot that had been walking the dusty roads of Jerusalem and wets the cloth and wipes the feet. Cleanses them. Then takes a dry towel and dries them. And this is meticulous, right? This is... Intentional, and the disciples are frozen watching Jesus. Now, this picture John wants us to have. But what John leaves out is another shocking element of this particular story. And I want you to look at Luke for just a minute to add some color to what happened on this night. Luke chapter 22, verses 24 we see something very, very unique, but very common among sinners. Notice the text. This is during that night. This is during the supper. Notice what verse 24 says. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which one was regarded as the greatest. Now let's stop there for just a minute and think about what is happening here. Here we have the rest of the story that compounds, really, the power of Jesus' actions. In verse 24, what are they doing? What are the disciples doing? What are they doing? 
They're fighting, right? They're arguing. Who's the greatest? They're disputing. No, I'm the greatest. No, Jesus picked me first, right? I left my father's fishing business to follow Jesus. Well, I, I was a tax collector. I was a collaborator with Rome, Matthew's saying. And now look at me. I've left everything to follow Jesus. They're trying to do what? They're jockeying for who is the, the most pronounced among all 12 of the disciples. They're, these men are fighting over who was the greatest. You see, the reason these men did not serve when they realized there was no foot washer present at this meal reveals their self-importance. This is what you need to understand today about this situation. They all arrived, whether together or one by one, and began to stand around and realizing, hey, where, where's the guy or gal who washes our feet? Did anyone step to the plate to say, let me do that servitude for you? Let me do this minuscule act of service since there's no one here? No, what were they doing? They were all too busy talking about their greatness. Sadly, you see too many in the church have the same attitude. Too many of us have this same attitude. Because too much in the church goes undone because of the same reason. We act like we're part of the union, we're a unionized organization. This is how many Christians act in the church. Well, since I'm part of the union, it's not my job to mop or change a light bulb. That's for somebody else. Right? You know, my job is to set out the chairs. My job is to stack the chairs. My job is to serve money. Oh, wait, I give a lot to the church. I have my ministry, so don't ask me to do anything else, please. You say, we might not express this openly like the disciples here. I'm the greatest. <laughs> I'm the greatest among the twelve. It's me. But you and I tend to act this way internally, and it's seen in our lack of serving others. Because we're too great. We're too busy. I already do enough for the church, right? This hinders service when we don the attitude of the disciples. However, what does Jesus say in this context? Later on, in verse 27 of Luke 22, he says, For who is the greater? The one who reclines at the table or the one who serves? Is it not the one who reclines at the table? But I am among you as one who serves, is what Jesus is saying. And I believe this is Luke's account of what we see in John 13. He's telling us that Jesus took the position of a servant to teach these disciples that they are in sin by being so self-centered. So it is within this climate, turn back to John 13, it is, in, it is within this climate that Jesus demonstrates what it means to be great, what it means to serve by taking up the towel, the wash basin, and washing the disciples' feet. And as I've studied this and pondered this and prayed over this text, dear church, it is my prayer that this church's climate will never fall to this type of demeanor that the disciples display. And I would encourage you today that you pray 
like there's no tomorrow, that God would give you the type of heart that is in Christ and not the disciples. You see, this shocking service here in verse 5 does not bode well with one particular disciple. Look at verse 6. So in the midst of Jesus going from disciple to disciple, Peter is watching Jesus getting close to him. And he's like, oh my goodness. And then he comes to Jesus. Verse 6, so he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? He's shocked, isn't he? He's shocked at what Jesus is doing. He's shocked at the fact he has just washed John's feet, Matthew's feet, and now he's at Peter's feet. And he's like, Lord, you're going to wash my feet? Really? Now, now we know this question G Peter's asking. Peter's question really falls into the category when we see someone in our own life that we love and respect doing a task or doing something that we say, you should never be doing this. Right? I remember my grandmother, rest her soul, used to do things she should never do. And because we loved her so much, we were like, grandmother, put that down. Grandmother, you shouldn't be digging that hole. Let me have. I mean, seriously, they had a garden. They, had a, they worked all the time. And you would just see her working, her old feeble self out there working. You're like, Grandmother, no, let me, let me do this. This is a task suited for a young buck like myself, right? We know that. This is what Peter is saying. And I love this. Notice what he says. Lord, curios. It's not rabbi, it's not teacher, it is Lord. And if anybody among the disciples who knew who Jesus was truly, it should be Peter, right? Because what has Peter confessed of Jesus? Peter has already confessed when Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And then he says, who do you say that I am? What does Peter say? You are the Christ. The Son of the living God. So Peter here in this context is recalling that to mind saying, how could you do this? It is not right, Jesus. Hendricks, Hendrickson says this in his commentary. It's just a little phrase. I thought it was very telling. He says, the Lord of glory on one hand and Peter's dirty feet on the other. What a contrast. And Peter gets it. Peter's like, you're Jesus. You're the Lord of heaven. And you're going to wash my feet? Dear church, are you shocked when you read this? Are you shocked at verse 5? Are you shocked like Peter? I'm sad to say that we're probably not. Why aren't we shocked? Like Peter. It's because we don't grasp the height and depth and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. And His willingness to take on the actions of a slave. Here's why we don't connect the dots here in John 13. When it comes to Jesus. Because at work, let's say, when a dignitary shows up, when your boss shows up, when a CEO of your company shows up, when your company commander walks in the room, and he begins, let's say, starting, starts to do your job. You're like, wait a second. You're the boss, right? 
you're the commander. You shouldn't be changing the oil here. You shouldn't be, you know, typing in data here. That's my job. That's for me to do. You understand that connection, right? He's the boss. He's the commander. He's the CEO of the company. Why is he down here delivering mail? We connect those dots. But dear church, do we connect the dots here in John 13 that Jesus is the Lord of heaven? And Peter recognizes this and said, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Really? Peter's mindset really is we ought to be washing and serving you, not the other way around. But clearly in this context, these men were too selfish, too concerned about their own needs, and not the needs of others. And I believe here the glory of Christ in this context is so amazing because I want you to see Jesus' next shocking action in his response to Peter. Look at verse 7. Peter is very short-sighted here. Peter is ignorant here of what Jesus is doing. But Jesus lovingly responds. Right? He lovingly takes time to respond to Peter's true concern. He says, what I do, you do not realize now but you will understand hereafter. Basically what he's saying here is he's saying, Peter, I understand. You don't get it. Right now, in this very moment, you do not understand what my actions symbolize. You do not understand. You do not fully realize. But there's coming a time. Look at the text, verse 7. You will understand. John uses oida and ginosko here in this passage, saying clearly that right now, oida, you don't know cognitively what this is all about. But in the future, you're going to have a better, deeper understanding, ginosko, of what this truly means. And basically, Peter will be given all truth once the Holy Spirit comes, right, and fills the disciples with knowledge. So here we see the shocking service. Next, let's look at the shocking response in verse 8 and 9. Now, Peter speaks up again, like vintage Peter always does, right? Peter is quick to speak his mind. He's quick to shoot both barrels. He's quick to never think, but speak. And we laugh at that and joke about that, but a lot of us act like that. And we shouldn't. Just because it's in your head doesn't mean it's got to come out of your mouth. You look way smarter when your mouth is closed. I mean, that's just practical truth we need to hear today. The proverb says that you will reveal how foolish you are when you begin to speak. And some of us need to realize that we need to be quiet more than we need to speak so we can think more highly of you. Right? Peter is the personification of this. Always speaking out of turn. Always speaking, thinking he's saying the right thing. Look at this shocking response to the Lord here. When Jesus says, you, you will realize eventually. But Peter says, wait a second, Jesus. Pull the car over here, Jesus. You're wrong. You will never wash my feet. And you can see Jesus, Peter here in this moment recoiling his feet back, right? Recoiling his feet, saying, no, nope, get back, Jesus. You're never going to do this because I know who you are. And this is a false sense of humility here because he's not obeying the Lord. One. But Peter's outrage here is the strongest in the Greek. Ume basically is this idea of not, not, or no, no, double negative just to show his outrage. And the outrage needs to be understood in this way. Peter, for Peter, this was too humiliating to bear to have the Son of God, to have the Christ to wash his feet. Jesus, here you go again. 
doing and saying things that are way too uncomfortable for me. This is, what Peter, this is why Peter responds this way. When Jesus, at one point in his ministry, said to the disciples, guess what, I'm going to die. I'm going to be betrayed. I'm going to be handed over to the Roman entity. I'm going to be crucified, but in three days later, what's going to happen? I'm going to rise again. And what does Peter do? Mark chapter 8 says that Peter pulls Jesus aside and says, no, 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 no. This is a rebuke. Jesus, you, this ain't going to happen. And what does Jesus say to Peter? Peter, get behind me, Satan. This is Peter again acting like this. Never will you wash my feet. Peter doesn't have a clue what he's saying. He doesn't have a clue. Peter, most often in his Christian experience, always has his eyes on himself. It looks spiritual. Jesus, you're never going to die. That's not good. No, no. Jesus, you're not going to wash my feet. That's, that's not good. Right? You can't do this. It's not... I mean, that looks hoity-toity, that looks noble, right? That looks spiritual. Oh, yes, you know, we could never have Jesus wash our feet. You're Jesus, right? That's just that's Peter's attitude. Later in this chapter, Peter again is going to show himself foolish by saying, Lord, I'll go to you to your death. And Jesus says, no, Peter, you're going to deny me. So here Peter is acting in his same old ways. Motivated by carnal and selfish ambition. But I want you to notice Jesus' powerful response. Verse 8. Jesus answered Peter, If I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Now Jesus here comes full force at Peter with a powerful and loaded truth. Seems from a glance, as we read this, this to be a kind of harsh response to Peter's outrage. Instead of Jesus being harsh, Jesus here is teaching Peter a vital truth that will be made clear later to him. But here is the point Jesus is making. Dear church, you cannot miss this. Jesus is saying this, Peter, if you cannot accept this act of my humiliation, of washing your feet, Peter, you will never accept my greatest act of humiliation, which will be dying for you. You see, Jesus here's response to Peter, Jesus is not thinking about Jesus is thinking about the whole of his humiliation, not just this one part of washing the disciples' feet. And Peter, in this moment, looks at Jesus before, verse, uh, before this response. He says, Lord, I can't allow you to do this for me. I can't allow you to wash my feet. And Jesus' response is, Peter, if you will not allow me to wash your feet in this moment, in this, in this simple, humbling act of washing your feet, how will you ever embrace my greatest act of service? On your behalf. That's the point. And Peter here is really saying it is too much for me to understand. It's too much for me to grasp, Lord, for you to wash my feet. And then Jesus says, then it is certainly going to be too much for you to embrace the true service that I came to provide you in atoning and the cleansing from sin. You see, everything Jesus did in his ministry by way of either teaching or healing or serving all pointed to his greater purpose. And in this case here, the washing of the disciples' feet was a symbolic act. It was symbolic by pointing out how the Lord of glory came to serve. It's not just in the washing. 
but in the dying for them and giving them spiritual cleansing that they need. All of this is symbolic. Peter, are you outraged by me serving as the lowest human servant? Jesus says, you ain't seen nothing yet. You ain't seen nothing yet. If you can't accept me washing your feet, how will you ever embrace my death? The injustice of my death. And ultimately, Peter will not be able to handle it. Because he denies the Lord in Jesus' most desperate moment. But thank goodness Jesus, Jesus told Peter what? I pray for you. That your faith will last. That it will stand. Dear friend, the question I think applies to us this morning. What part of Jesus' humiliation do you find acceptable? And what part of Jesus' humiliation do you find unacceptable? You see, in the South... I truly believe many do not believe in salvation by grace alone. It's too offensive for any good southerner to recognize that he is a sinner. No, we bless everybody, right? Southerners think by God's grace... Just because they're born in the South, that that merits some kind of warrant to be right with God because of their lineage. My dad's a deacon, my dad's a pastor, my whole family's been in church, right? But they find too offensive to recognize there's nothing in any person, whether you're born in the South or not, to realize that there's nothing you bring to make yourself right with God. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Nothing else. But too many people are ashamed of the humiliation of Christ in the truest sense because they don't look at what Jesus did for a wretched sinner like them. They're too willing to say that. No, I, I, I have to say a prayer, right? I got to go get baptized first. I got to go get my life somewhat right with God first before I can come to God. That's how too many people operate. Because they can't embrace the reality that the holy, perfect Son of God had to come to this earth and die for them. It communicates an unwillingness. Lord, you will never wash my feet. I'll wash my feet for myself. And I'll work my way to heaven. I don't need you. And Jesus says, if I can't wash your feet, you're never to accept my greatest work for you. This is the shocking response. But Peter has another shocking response in verse 9. Look at it. Here, Peter goes overboard. Right? What does he say? Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head, right? You, if you're going to wash my feet, if you say it's necessary, okay, I'm going to do it. But you're going to have to wash what? My hands and my feet. This goes back to him being a little embarrassed about what Jesus is doing. You've got to meet me where I'm at, Jesus. No. Ain't no works involved here. If you don't embrace my ultimate humiliation for you, you're never going to be saved. And here, Peter is saying, Lord, you've got to do everything else. This is Peter, again, going from one extreme to the next. Peter here misses the point, doesn't he? Of what Jesus is really saying. He's, this is not about washing. It has nothing to do with washing his hands or his head. It has nothing to do with it. It has everything to do with these disciples accepting what Jesus did and was doing his humble service so this morning we've seen the shocking service of Jesus we've seen the shocking response of Jesus to Peter now Peter to Jesus but I want you to notice verse 10 and 11 the shocking knowledge look at verse 10 Jesus said to him he who has bathed needs not only to wash his feet 
but, but, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not all of you. For he knew the one who was betraying him for this reason said, not all of you are clean. Here we see Jesus' shocking knowledge. Jesus here in verse 10 is responding to Peter's foolish response with a practical truth. And this practical truth is what? If you've taken a bath in this context, guess what? You're clean. And when you show up to a wedding or a dinner party or to some other social event, all you need to have cleaned is what? Your feet. Now Jesus here again is not talking about washing. He's talking about a spiritual dynamic. Jesus here is teaching Peter that to be bathed is to be saved. Can you say that? <laughs> what Jesus is teaching Peter here is to be bathed is to be saved. And he clearly tells Peter, you're clean. He's saying, Peter, you're already in the kingdom. That's encouraging. Because Peter is, he's out there. In his actions and what he's saying. But Jesus is saying, you're clean, Peter, not because of what you've done. Because of what I've done. You've been forgiven. You've been made righteous, Peter. You've been justified, Peter. You've been forgiven, Peter. You don't need a bath. All you need is to have your feet washed. And this feet washing can symbolize for us today that necessity to have one's life right with God on a daily basis, right? Communing with the Lord. Having the process of spiritual growth taking place day to day. Needing that spiritual cleansing of our feet, so to speak. This is what Jesus is teaching here. But then Jesus speaks here of his knowledge about those in this context that are clean, who do not need a bath, and those in this context that are not clean and in need of spiritual cleansing. Look at verse 10. He says, you are clean, but not all of you. And then we go to verse 11 and we see the knowledge that the Savior has that John says, for he knew the one who was betraying him. For this reason he said, not all of you are clean. And we know who Jesus is talking about. Jesus is talking about Judas. Here we have Peter and Judas contrasted. Peter, you're clean. Obviously, Judas is not here we see Jesus' sovereign knowledge about this situation. He knew Judas' spiritual condition. He knew Peter's spiritual condition. And he's saying to Peter, and he's saying of Judas here, which I believe is a measure of grace in this context, because who's in this context? Judas. Judas hears what Jesus is saying. This could be a ministry to Judas specifically in this statement. Judas, are you listening? Some are clean, some are not. Dear friend, the church is filled with Peter's and the church is filled with Judas's. And the scary thing for all of us, or the, the, not scary thing, but the necessity for all people is to say, who am I? The Lord knows Paul says the Lord knows those who are His. Are you a Peter? Are you a Judas? Jesus knows. There is no shocker for Jesus. This knowledge here of our Lord Jesus, again, shows that He is in control of all things, even this dinner, and even over Satan, and over Judas. You see, Judas' betrayal, though, is prophesied, as I mentioned last week, by David in Psalm 41.9. And in verse 18, down here, Jesus even quotes Psalm 41, verse 9, and says, I do not speak of all of you. I know the ones I have chosen, but it is that the Scriptures may be fulfilled. He who eats my bread has lifted up his heel against me. Jesus knows, prophetically and sovereignly, that Judas has been appointed for destruction. And it will be P Judas that will lead betrayer, the ones to Jesus that will arrest him. But here's another fabric. I, I don't want you to miss this, though, in all of this, of Jesus' humiliation. 
This is another piece of the humiliation of Christ. Jesus here, possessing sovereign knowledge of all things, even washes his opponents, his enemies' feet. And again, this is another layer of Jesus' humiliation in that he washed the one who would betray him. He washed his feet. Wow. How controversial is that? How selfless is that? To look across the table and see the one who will betray you with a kiss and wash his feet as well. How radical are Jesus' actions. Now I can't help but think about a couple of things as we think about this and wrap this up this morning. Because Jesus here is setting out a living example of what he taught. Hold your place there and look at Matthew for a minute. Matthew chapter 5. I want you to see this as we wrap this up this morning. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus on the Sermon on the Mount here teaches in verse 39. He says, But I say to you, do not resist an evil person. But whoever slaps you on your cheek, turn the other to him also. If anyone wants to sue you and take your shirt, let him have your coat also. Whoever forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to him what? Give to him who asks of you, and do not turn away from him who wants to borrow from you. You have heard it said, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. You see, in John 13, Jesus is giving you and I what this looks like. In your carnality, what do you want to do when someone hurts you? In your carnality, what do you want to do when someone slanders you, takes from you, you want to get your pound of flesh. Right? You want to get revenge. You want to get them for what they've done to you. I will get you. But that's not like Jesus. Jesus says to love those, pray for those, give to those who hurt you. In his actions also we see the character of God revealed. Look at Romans chapter 5 for a moment. In washing Judas' feet and loving Judas in this moment, we see Romans 5, 8 lived out. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Do you see that? While you were yet a sinner, God loved you and demonstrated that by sending Christ to die for you. And in Jesus' action here, He's demonstrating the love of God. He's demonstrating the love of God to Judas while he was an enemy, while he was there ready to betray. Jesus still loves him. Speaks to truth in that moment. I know who are clean and who are not. He still washes the disciples' feet. In John 13, Jesus even washes Judas' feet as that living, tangible demonstration of what it means to love one's enemies. Now, dear church, as we bring this to a close. John 13 is one of the greatest passages on the humiliation of Christ. And it's what makes this passage so shocking, so breathtaking, to look at Jesus, the Lord of heaven, the Lord of earth, the Lord of all, to wash the dirty feet of sinful men. Jesus' willingness to embrace the lowest task is, is my prayer for us. It's my prayer for myself, too, that we would 
by the power of the Spirit, understand this reality so that we can follow Christ in like manner. Because what's going to fuel the rest of this whole text is grasping this. Grasping that Jesus' willingness to serve in this way should radically transform us. Not only in our love for Jesus, but in our service of Jesus and our service in the church. So with that being said, let us pray as we close. Father, we thank you for this word. We thank you for your service, Lord. We, we, we embrace you, Lord Jesus, in your humiliation. As uncomfortable as it might be for us at times to recognize that we are such wretched sinners that the beautiful, perfect Lamb of God had to be slain on our behalf. And I pray, Lord, that we would not be, ash that we would not be ashamed of that, but that we would embrace it. That we would recognize what God recognizes about all of humanity, that we are lost without hope, but that we would see that the greatest divine act in all of history is that of serving others. And Lord, may that change us today. And may we love you more, serve you more, and glorify you more because of what you've done for us as sinners. And I pray this in the beloved name of Christ. Amen.